Hi, and welcome back. Today, we'll be discussing one of the lesser-known gems of early sociological theory, George Zimmel. Although he is often left out of the sociological canon, Zimmel made a number of contributions to sociology that remain relevant today. In particular, Zimmel was an expert on urban life, which in his time had emerged as the primary mode of modern living in the West. A flexible mind, Zimmel lectured on topics ranging from ethics, logic, pessimism, art, psychology, and sociology. Today, however, we'll just be focusing on two of his notable works, The Metropolis and Mental Life, and his very brief essay, The Stranger. These two essays, when taken together, clarify his approach to social analysis. George Zimmel was born on March 1st, 1858, in Berlin, Germany, into a prosperous Jewish family. However, he was raised as a Christian and would later distance himself from organized religion. After losing his father at 16, young Zimmel had the good fortune of being taken in by the founder of an international music publishing house, who endowed him with the large fortune that enabled him to pursue his scholarly endeavors without financial strain. This would be of enormous benefit to Zimmel, as he would later struggle to find an academic appointment. Beginning in 1876, Zimmel studied philosophy and history at the Humboldt University of Berlin. In 1881, he completed his doctoral thesis on the Kantian philosophy of matter explicitly aligning himself with the Neo-Kantian movement that arose in the late 19th and early 20th centuries as a response to the ascendancy of Hegelian metaphysics. Despite having the support of acclaimed friends and associates like Max Weber and Edmund Husserl, Zimmel had a hard time finding a place in academia. This was partly because he was seen as a Jew during an era of anti-Semitism in academia, However, Zimmel may also be considered something of a pop sociologist. He could be dismissive of the insular standards of academia, writing articles directed towards the general public rather than other academic sociologists. In this sense, Zimmel was possibly one of sociology's first public intellectuals. Like others of the sociological canon, Zimmel lived through a period of dramatic social reconfiguration at all levels of society. He was among the first generation of theorists to grapple with the social, psychological, and economic consequences of industrialization and urbanization. The urban population was growing at an exponential rate, leading to new forms and configurations of social life that Zimmel would explore exhaustively in his works. Eventually, in 1914, Zimmel received a professorship at the German University of Strasbourg, but at the time, academic activities and lectures had been halted due to the outbreak of World War I. In 1917, Zimmel, exhausted and disillusioned with the war, stopped reading newspapers and withdrew to the Black Forest to finish his work. He died shortly before the end of the war. Zimmel's brief essay, The Stranger, not to be confused with the famous existentialist work of Albert Camus, is a foundational text in the sociology of space, a subdiscipline of sociology concerned with understanding the social practices, institutional forces, and material complexities of how humans and spaces interact. This essay offers a unique exploration of the role in nature of the stranger in society. For Zimmel, the stranger is the person who comes today and stays tomorrow. He is, so to speak, the potential wanderer. 
although he has not yet moved on. He has not quite overcome his freedom of coming and going. The stranger, then, is someone who is geographically near, but also socially or normatively distant. In the geographic sense, the stranger is defined not only by where he is now, but also by where he was before. His position within the local group is determined by the fact that he has not belonged to it from the very beginning, and thus, he imports certain qualities into the group which do not and could not have originated from within the group. A trained historian, Zimmel often evokes historical examples in his work to better illustrate his points. Here, he claims that the quintessential example of the stranger in economic history is the traitor. The traitor's role in society is justified by the fact that he brings goods into the social unit that cannot be obtained from within the social unit. The traitor is a stranger insofar as he comes in and out of the local unit, bringing things that cannot be found on the inside. Zimmel is preoccupied with economics in many of his writings, and at times, he verges on the logic of economic determinism. The stranger, however, is by no means simply an economic agent. Similarly to how the trader comes bearing foreign goods, the stranger also carries with him values, norms, and perspectives from outside the local social unit. According to Zimmel, this can manifest itself in a very useful social function. Objectivity. According to Zimmel, the stranger is not radically committed to the unique ingredients and peculiar tendencies of the group, and therefore approaches them with the specific attitude of objectivity. But objectivity does not simply involve passivity and detachment. It is a particular structure composed of distance and nearness, indifference and involvement. The balance between attachment and detachment imparts within the stranger a unique ability to act as an impartial observer, a critic, or a judge. The stranger therefore has the ability to see things in a way that might not be possible for other members of the community, because he is not so deeply ensnared within the same normative, ideological, and interpersonal networks of relations. This logic has been taken up by modern courts, as it is common practice today to move high-profile criminal cases to different districts in order to ensure a fair and unbiased jury. The position of the stranger, however, can also be a tenuous one. Because of his foreign perspective and origins, he is often scapegoated and persecuted during times of conflict and blamed for unrest within the social group. In summary, Zimmel suggests that, because of their particular position within the group, strangers often carry out special tasks that other members of the group are either incapable of or unwilling to carry out. Though we might think of it as a bad thing to be a stranger, Zimmel's essay shows us how strangers can serve an essential role in society. For Zimmel, the qualities of a stranger are not reducible to social class, gender, or even ethnicity. Rather, the stranger is defined by the fact that his history, and perhaps his future, extend beyond the spatial limits of the social group. In Metropolis and Mental Life, Simmel's most famous work, which was delivered first as a series of lectures in Dresden, Simmel explores differences in the quality and behavior of urban people versus townspeople by drawing reference to some of the foundational structural differences between the town and metropolis, such as group size, frequency of interactions, and the extent to which these interactions are rationalized. Zimmel takes the small-town life common in the pre-industrial period 
as a model against which to contrast and compare metropolitan life. Zimmel's analysis in this essay is an idealized one. He doesn't concern himself with speaking about any particular town or city. Instead, he focuses on qualities that are characteristically generalizable across all towns and cities. His treatment of the urban environment is thus very similar to Max Weber's use of ideal types, revealing Zimmel's anti-positivist leanings. According to Zimmel, the distinct features of urban life are conducive to a particular type of psychological experience. This is best exemplified in his description of the blasé outlook. According to Zimmel, the urban dweller must contend with an overwhelming amount of stimuli, leading to the development of what he calls a blasé attitude. This attitude is characterized by indifference and attachment, which emerges as a defense mechanism against the bombardment of sights, sounds, and experiences of the modern city. Zimmel claims that this blasé attitude emerges primarily from the specific frequency and type of interactions that take place within the city, as compared to the rural town environment. According to Zimmel, the frequency of the metropolitan individual's encounters with others forces him to regard them with a blasé indifference, because it stimulates the nerves to their utmost reactivity until they can finally no longer produce any reaction at all. In other words, the individual is desensitized to others through repeated non-stop exposure. The metropolis can be regarded as a mutual reserve of indifference, because its inhabitants are neither mentally nor emotionally capable of effectively responding to each of these frequent encounters. This is contrasted with the rural, small-town mentality. Interactions in the town are both comparatively infrequent and typically limited to a narrow range of familiar figures, coloring each encounter with an emotionally resonant quality. For Zimmel, the urban man is fundamentally more free than the townsperson as a function of the structure of his environment. Zimmel claims that the character of small town life, such as that that was common throughout the Middle Ages and much of the pre-industrial period, imposed such limits upon the movements of the individual in his relations with the outside world and on his inner independence and differentiation that the modern person could not even breathe under such conditions. Zimmel argues that a small group size yields a narrower culture, as small groups remain socially and culturally closed off from foreign groups to survive and preserve social cohesion. As he puts it, the self-preservation of very young associations requires a rigorous setting of boundaries and a centripetal unity, and for that reason, it cannot give room to the freedom and the peculiarities of inner and external development of the individual. In other words, small groups tend towards cultural homogeny because their stability is contingent upon similarity. This means that people within small groups experience enormous pressures to conform to one another. In addition, because the townsperson is known to almost everyone he encounters, he is thus necessarily under close observation within the social unit, with few anonymous venues for socialization and growth. The range of freedom of the individual is restricted by a narrow range of normative expectations and constant surveillance. This is the opposite case in the city, where the complexity of the social environment necessitates specialization and differentiation, thereby creating space for a greater range of legitimate behavioral patterns and identities.
Like many of his contemporaries, Zimmel was preoccupied with the rationalization of social life. In his view, the urban environment oriented the individual towards rationality. This is in part a consequence of desensitization via frequency of social interaction. It is also, however, a result of the metropolis's orientation around what Zimmel calls the money economy. As compared to the small town life, social interactions within the metropolis are more likely to take place in a financial context, encouraging the individual to consider them in a more calculating rather than emotional way. Thus, in the metropolis, money becomes the common denominator for all values across a diverse cast of people who have no personal basis upon which to interact with each other. Zimmel has been called a structuralist, and this is evident in his analysis of metropolitan rationalization. In sociology, structuralists take a macroscopic view of society as a complex system whose parts work together to promote solidarity and stability, like the different organs working together in a body. Zimmel argues that, unlike the small town, the city is a complex system comprised of networks of differentiated and interdependent organs. For example, in order for the bakers to provide food for the city, it is necessary that the bus drivers arrive on schedule to bring them to work. If one organ in the system fails, the entire social unit experiences significant dysfunction. The complexity of the urban environment and its compartmentalization into specialized organs necessitates a careful adherence to time and schedule to ensure coordination across a diverse range of classes. Zimmel claims that this leads to a mechanized, rationalized society where time is quantified and managed with unprecedented exactness. However, Zimmel's concept of rationalization also includes a shift towards a more instrumental view of time, with time itself becoming a commodity. In this context, time is not simply a natural rhythm to be experienced, but a resource to be utilized efficiently, often under the pressure of the clock. The phrase, time is money, comes to mind here. Zimmel introduces the concept of the metropolitan type, an individual who is adapted to these urban conditions and characterized by their intellectualistic, rational, and blasé nature. This metropolitan type epitomizes the adjustments of the individual psyche, which ultimately reflect the social structures of the metropolis. Zimmel's conception of the stranger someone who is both part of the group and yet separate from it in terms of perspective, aligns somewhat with his description of the modern city dweller, who experiences a unique form of freedom and individuality, but also a degree of alienation and isolation. The detached and fleeting nature of social interactions in the city reflect the interactions that Zimmel discusses in The Stranger. Both the stranger and the metropolitan individual are examples of what Zimmel calls social types. In Zimmel's work, social types are not merely the product of individual personalities, but are shaped by the social structures and interactions in which individuals participate. Social types are patterns, which reflect the ways in which individuals adapt to or are molded by their social environments. As such, Social types are characterized by certain behaviors, attitudes, or traits that generally tend to appear across individuals who occupy the same social position or context. Zimmel discusses other social types elsewhere, such as the poor and the adventurer. However, the concept of social type does not imply a deterministic view of social life. 
While social types reflect the influence of social structures and interactions on individual behavior, they do not completely determine it. And in real cases, we should expect great variety among people of the same social type. For Zimmel, the individual always retains a certain degree of autonomy and has a dialectical relationship with society, whereby each influences the other. Zimmel's work can be perplexing because it is concerned both with macro-level group dynamics as well as the specific psychological effects that these cause at the individual level. Zimmel's emphasis on things like interaction frequency and group size suggests a respect and interest in quantitative reasoning, and yet his work was also preoccupied with exploring the subjective and experiential dimensions of social life, such as the psychological responses to urban living. Now, the critical point I want to make about Zimmel here is that his claims about the blasé outlook are essentially assumptions about theory of mind, albeit well-argued ones. For Zimmel, sensory experience is the bridge between the metropolis and the mental life. In his own words, there is perhaps no psychic phenomenon which is so unconditionally reserved to the city as the blasé outlook. It is at first the consequence of those rapidly shifting stimulations of the nerves, which are thrown together in all their contrasts, and from which it seems to us the intensification of metropolitan intellectuality seems to be derived. But there's no way to really prove that these frequent, fleeting interactions of the stimulating city environment are indeed connected to the development of the blasé outlook. We don't really get much empirical substantiation out of Zimmel in this essay. His argument relies very heavily on logic and rhetoric. We might also criticize Zimmel for being overly general about the human mind, knowing today that there are many different types of brains which respond differently to the same stimuli. From a neurodiversity standpoint, Zimmel's totalizing claims about the urban mentality can seem a bit tenuous. Ultimately, Zimmel forces us to consider the ways in which the spaces we inhabit and the time we spend within them inform our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. He implies that, as individuals, we are in large part socially constructed, and a change in the spaces we inhabit could potentially constitute a change to who we are and how we think. We are, perhaps, inseparable from the places that we've been and the things and people that surround us. In the traditional Western mindset, personal development is often seen as an individualistic pursuit, whereby one changes their thoughts and habits through discipline and ethic. In the Zemelian view of the mind, however, if we want to change ourselves, we should be mindful about the environment, structures, and people we surround ourselves with. Changing any of these things could go a long way in changing the way we experience ourselves and our reality. The broadness and flexibility of Zimmel's theories can be seen in the fact that, today, his legacy is carried on by scholars in areas ranging from cultural sociology to social network analysis. The deeply interdisciplinary nature of his life and work helped set the norm for a vision of sociology that frequently and productively engages with works from history, economics, psychology, philosophy, and a range of other scientific disciplines. In my opinion, this acceptance of disciplinary adventurism is one of the main reasons sociology remains such a powerful approach to social analysis today.